further, in today's video, we will focus on implementing what we have learned about the individual risk model in order to value an insurance portfolio. We are a group of almost actuaries made up of Edson Martinez, Lili Perez, Pau Zamora, Erika Villalpando, and myself, Rosangel Medrano. Let's begin checking the next problem. You are given a portfolio with 60 whole life insurance contracts for 40 year old people. And assuming the company charters the insurance benefit of one payable at the end of year of death for the next omega minus X years for a person of age X plus K times the square root of the variance of C as premium to each customer, we will use the inverse transform and Monte Carlo simulation techniques to find the least k such that the probability of ruin is less than 5%. After we solve the problem, we will try to answer the next questions that keep us awake in the middle of the night. Which of these approaches do, do we prefer? What are the advantages and disadvantages of each one of them? So let's begin with the problem. First of all, let's talk about the Monte Carlo simulations. These simulations are used to model the probability of different outcomes in a process that cannot easily be predicted due to the intervention of random variables. It is a technique used to understand the impact of risk and uncertainty in prediction and forecasting models. As well, it can be used to tackle a range of problems in virtually every field such as finance, engineering, supply chain, and science. It is also referred to as a multiple probability simulation. It is important to mention the following. First, Monte Carlo simulations help to explain the impact of risk and uncertainty in prediction and forecasting models. Second, the basis of a Monte Carlo simulation involves assigning multiple values to an uncertain variable to achieve multiple results and then averaging the results to obtain an estimate. And last but not least, Monte Carlo simulations assume perfectly efficient markets. Finally, as a fun fact, the technique was first used by scientists working on the atom bomb. Now we have to recall the inverse transform technique. For this, we have that the inverse transform sampling is a method for generating random numbers for any probability distribution by using its inverse cumulative distribution F minus 1x. Recall that the cumulative distribution for a random variable x is f of x is equal to the probability of x being less than or equal to x. In what follows, we assume that our computer can on demand generate independent realizations of a random variable u uniformly distributed on the interval 0 to 1. Moreover, we have that this returns the largest number x from the domain of the distribution. Now, for the assumptions, we have two cases one with the same ages and the other one with different ages. In both, we are going to have a discount rate of 3% and a benefit of 1,000. And a table M makes for ages 82 to 89. How to calculate the variance of C? As we know, the variance of C is the second moment minus the first square moment. But for this second part, we will, will be the first square expected value that we already have. So we have to calculate the second moment in order that in a few steps, we will only have to make a little subtraction. To calculate the second moment will be the sum from k equals zero to n minus one of a discount factor raised to the k minus one raised to the power of two multiplied by the probability that a person of age x survives k years and die the next year. After that, we do a simple math and then make a simple variable change where W will be the discount factor raised to the power of two. Then we know that W equals one over one plus I raised to the power of two. Thus the expected value of C squared will be the sum of K equals zero to N minus one of W raised K plus one times multiplied by the probability that a person of HX survives K years and die the next year. 
So let's suppose I that one plus J equals one plus I raised to the power of two, where we take J out of the formula. And at the end, we will we'll have that J equals one plus I raised to the power of two minus one. Now we can calculate the second moment with the formula of expected value, but with a J rate that's the same as one plus I raised to the power of two minus one. Let's see how this is computed in Excel spreadsheet and also in Visual Basic. In column A, we have ages from 15 to 99 years. And in column B, we have the probability of death at each age from one year to the other. So, for instance, in here, uh, we have the probability that, the per that a person that is 19 years old will die in the next year. So now we have to estimate how much we are going to charge to each person. So according to the exercise, we need to consider the case of a person of 40 years. In column C, here, we have the future lifetime of the person denoted by its letter K, which can go from zero years to 60. We just took the ages we had in column A minus 40, because uh, we are considering the case of a 40 year old person. In column D, we write the probability that a person age 40 will live for the next K years. So when K is zero, we know that this probability is equal to one because it's a probability that the person is alive in this precise moment. Now, the probability that a person age 40 will live one more year is this one here multiplied by one minus the probability that the person dies from age 40 to age 41. In this cell, we have the probability that a person age 40 will live two more years which is the probability that the person lives one more year multiplied by one minus the probability that the person dies from age 41 to age 42. Now we can just repeat this up to here. That is the probability that a person age 40 will live 60 more years, which as expected is zero. In column E, we write the probability that a person age 40 will live k more years and then die in the next one. These are just three ways to express this probability, and this one here is the actual notation for it. So to calculate this, we just multiply the probability that a person age 40 will live k more years by the probability that a person dies at age 40 plus k. So in here we have the probability that a person of 40 years will live zero more years, which is one, multiplied by the probability that a person dies between 40 and 41 years old. In here we have the probability that a person will live one more year, multiplied by the probability of a person of now 41 years uh, will die in the next year. Then we repeat this until our last value of k. So this is a mass function, so the sum of these probabilities, as you can see, is equal to 1. In column F, we just calculate the present value using, using the discount rate given in the problem, which is 3%. So for instance, when k is equal to 0, we ring one period to present value because we suppose that the person will have died at the end of year zero. Then we just repeat this for all k's in column C. In here, we calculate the actuarial present value of one monetary unit payable at the end of the year of death by computing the sum product of the values we have on column E with the values on column F. Now, in a recursive way, in here we put for k equal to 60 the present value, which is 0, and if we're located one year before the end of the life of the person and the period of coverage is one year, 
Then the present value is the probability of the person dying in that year divided by the discount factor plus the probability that the person survives divided by the discount factor multiplied by the present value of the insurance for the next year, as it is shown here. We can apply this same thinking for evaluating what happens two years before the death of the person, like this. Now, uh, we just repeat this in a recursive way until we reach the top of uh, the table. As you can see, we obtained the same values here and here, but by different means. Now we are going to show a function that allows us to calculate the present value of one monetary unit payable at the end of the year of debt of a person of age X. So first we have this function here that tells us the probability of surviving from age X to age X plus K. So the parameters are the age of the person and the number of years K that we wanted to survive. Then, with this function here, we are going to calculate, as we said, the present value of one monetary unit payable at the end of the year of debt for a person age x. Uh, this function needs the previous one that we just described. So, in here the parameters are the age of the person, the number of years of coverage, and the discount rate, which in our case is 3%. So in here we declare a variable for the financial factor and here we set a variable to count. We give an initial value to the expectation and in here we define the financial discount factor. So this is our discount factor to the power of k plus 1 multiplied by the probability that the person survives k years times the probability that the person dies in the next k plus 1 years. And we use this cycle here to consider the sum. Now we are going to use a formula we just created to obtain a third way to calculate this value here. We just call our formula and write the parameters that it uses. These are the age, 40, the years of coverage, 60 and the discount rate of, in this case, 3%. Now that we have this, we need to calculate the variance. In order to do this, we use once again our formula and write the parameters that are a person of age 40 that is going to be covered for the next 60 years at a discount rate of 1.03 squared minus 1, and then we just subtract the original expectation squared. Another way to calculate the variance is taking the column F squared, as you can see here, and computing the sum product of column H and E. Then, once again, we just subtract the expectation squared, and we obtain the same result as before. Now, we need to calculate the premium that we know is this, plus k times the square root of the variance, but notice that we do not know the value of k, so in here we will just put, for example, k equals 1, and with that value we obtain this premium here. In here, we just copied the values obtained for the net single premium, which is the expected value of the benefit, and in here we copied the variance. In column J, we put a variable that counts in order to make simulations using the inverse transform technique and the central limit theory. We generate a random number between 0 and 1 that represents a probability then we use a mean for the normal distribution of 60 times the expectation of the random variable and the variance equal to the variance of the benefit random variable. In column L, we are going to calculate the loss for the group of 60 persons that have the same age of 40 and the same benefit. 
So please notice that in here we are considering a benefit of 1, but the problem specifies that the benefit for each person is 1000. So we will get to it later. Okay, so in order to do this, we compute what we need to pay minus what we have. That is 60 times the premium we charge to each person. So as you can see, the loss is negative, which means that we are actually winning. This number represents a gain. In column M, we just ask if there is room for the company. So if the loss is bigger or equal to zero, there, then there is room. So we write a one. Otherwise, there is not room and we write a zero. Now, as we said before, in column J, we count simulations to use the Monte Carlo simulation technique. In this case, we did 150,000 simulations. In here, we write the probability of ruin, which is given by the average of column M, and we obtain a zero. Okay, so this is because, on this case, for a benefit of one, we are charging 0 0.53 cents. This makes the insurance just too expensive. So, uh, if we modify the premium by changing the parameter k, uh, we can obtain a different result. So, let's try to do it. So, if we set k at 0 0.216, we have a probability of ruin of around 5%. So, this is because the premium decreases, and therefore, the probability of ruin for the company is higher. Okay, so since we are using the normal distribution, we are calculating the claims of every iteration using the normal approximation, as we showed before. So the central limit theorem states that when we have a sufficient number of random variables, an amount that actually tends to infinity, the sum has a normal distribution. But how do we know if the random variables we have are sufficient or not? To decide, we need to use other approach. Now we are going to make another program. This function returns a 95% confidence interval for the probability of ruin of an insurance company that pays one monetary unit at the end of the year of failure uh, for a population of the same age. This function uh, is the function of the actual person value. Desviación is the square root of the variance of Z. Uh, this variable is a net single premium for the 60 persons we have. And this one uh, returns the present value of one monetary unit payable at the end of the year of failure for a population of the same age. So with this cycle here, we calculate the total sum of the simulations we make, given we have the cumulative vectors of the 60 persons. If this sum is bigger than the net single premium, then it means that the losses we have are bigger than the premiums we charge, and therefore there is room for the company and we count a 1. In our case, we count a 0. At the end, as you can see here, we calculate the average. In here, we calculate the variance in order to be able to calculate the left and right side of the confidence interval required, and the probability of ruin by means of the Monte Carlo technique. So, in here, we have the probabilities that a person of 40 years old will die in the next k years. We just computed 1 minus the values we had in here. For each k from 0 to 60. Here we have this parameter times sigma and the financial discount rate specified in the problem, that is 3%. Here we have the number of persons on our portfolio and the ages that, as you can see, are equal to 40 in all cases. In these columns, F, G, and H, we just copy the results we obtained before in here for all the persons on our portfolio. But notice that now we are taking into account the death benefit for each person, that is 1,000. 
the premium is the same for every person because, because they have the same age and therefore same insurance benefit and variance. Here we have the simulated loss that we obtain using the same thinking as in here. We just multiplied by the benefit of 1000 and we did 150,000 simulations. In column K, we have the sum of the premiums we charge, that is, the sum of the values we have on column H. In column L, we compare the sum of the premiums to our simulated loss. So, if the loss is bigger than the money we have, we write a number 1, because then there is room for the company. Otherwise, we write a 0. Here we just calculate the average of this column to obtain an approximate value for the probability of ruin for the company by means of the Monte Carlo simulation and inverse transform techniques. So, returning to our original problem, we need to find the least case such as the probability of ruin is less than 5%. Here we are using the formula we programmed before to obtain the confidence interval. The parameters are this range here, the number of simulations we want to do for each person, on this case 10,000, the discount rate, the number of persons in our portfolio, the age that they have, which is in this case 40, and time C. Here we calculate the average of the left and right side of the 95% confidence interval generated. And we obtain this probability of ring that, as you can see, is less than 5%. Now we're going to do the same exercise but considering different ages. So this function here returns a 95% confidence interval for the probability of ruin of an insurance company that pays one monetary unit at the end of the year of failure for a population of different ages. In here, we are counting all the ages we have in our database using the function uBond, that means upper bond. This function tells us the last index of the arrangement called ages. This number one means that we need to work with the first dimension, the last index of the first dimension of the matrix called ages. So in here we start the net single premium at zero, and this first cycle starts at one and it goes up to the number of persons we have. So the first person is X years old. This is the position zero of the arrangement ages. We generate the probability distribution for that person on HX by using the function called HENDIST. Desviación is just a calculation of the square root of the variance of the random variable Z. This next instruction represents the accumulation of the net single premiums of all the persons. This variable is compounded by the accumulation of the insurance of every person plus the number of times sigma that we specified in here, multiplied by the standard deviation that we calculated in this previous step. In this next line, we ask for the k entry of the present value of the population we have. This is done with this function here, that we defined previously. So this function returns us a matrix. So for j equals to 1 to a number of simulations, that can be, for instance, 10,000 simulations per person, each simulation brings 1 divided by the discount factor to a power of 1 plus a random value given by this function. So this function is just an implementation of the inverse transformation. It generates a number, a random number between 0 and 1. Then it looks for that number in the first column of the distribution table and it returns a value next to it in the second column. So we are generating the number of complete years that that person is left of life. We want to compare the financial present value of all these simulations to what we will have charged the uh, person. So, returning to this part, we have that 
e is a vector which entries are vectors as well. We can have vectors of vectors. So here, for each person, we accumulate the present values. So we have that all this uh, for, for cycle calculates the sum of all the simulations we have made until the sum of the simulation no sim. In here, we compare each simulation to the net single premium we calculated. If the sum is bigger than what we charge, then we are ruined and we count a 1. Otherwise, we count a 0. At the end, we just calculate the mean using the Monte Carlo technique and we also use all the simulations we've made to calculate the variance. The variance allows us to calculate the left side of the confidence interval at 95% of probability and also the right side. In here, we ask for the arrangement C as a result and we end the function. In here, we have once again these parameters, time sigma and the financial discount rate. In column C, we have simulated different ages between 15 and 99 years for each version of our portfolio of 60. In column D, we calculate the present value of one monetary unit payable at the end of the year of debt for a person of this age, using this formula that we showed and explained before. The parameters are the age of the person, the number of years of coverage, and the discount rate. We repeat this for all the persons in our portfolio. In column E we have the variance, that as you can see is different for every age. We just use once again our formula and write the parameters, that are a person of this age on column C, that is going to be covered for the next 100 minus x years at a discount rate of 1.03 squared minus 1. Then we just subtract the original expectation squared. Mm. The premium is the value of the insurance plus times sigma the square root of the variance multiplied by 1000, which is the benefit. And we just repeat this for all the persons on our portfolio. Now we are going to do once again simulations using the inverse transform and the Monte Carlo techniques. In here we calculated the simulated loss using again the central limit theorem, as you can see here. This part generates a random number between 0 and 1, it generates a probability. We use a mean for the normal distribution of the sum of these expectations multiplied by the insurance benefit. And the standard deviation equal to the square root of the sum of the variances here. And again, we multiply this by the benefit. In column K, we write the sum of the premiums we calculated in column F. And in column L, we compare the sum of the premiums we charge to our simulated loss. So, once again, we write a number 1 if our loss is bigger than what we charge, because in that case there is ruin for the company, and otherwise we write a 0. We did 150,000 simulations. In here, we compute the average of this column to obtain an approximation of the probability of ruin for the company. As you can see, this probability is less than 5%. In here, we use the formula we programmed before to obtain the 95% confidence interval for the probability of rain. The parameters are this range of ages, the number of simulations per person, the discount rate, and time sigma. Here, we calculate the average of the left and right side of the 95% confidence interval generated, and we obtain this probability of rain that as you can see is also less than 5%. If we want to make this interval smaller, we need to make bigger, a bigger number of simulations. Using the same value for time sigma in the approach of the central limit theorem, we can see that the probability of ruin is different. So instead of using this value here, 
we are going to use a bigger one. So, for instance, we write 0 0.28 here as our new time signal. The premium 2 is calculated using the value 0 0.28 as it is shown here. And in here we have the, var the variations of these two premiums. Now, if we compute the maximum variation, we get that 3.5% which means that we will be charging almost a variation of our discount rate. As for the conclusions in, for, this pro, for this problem, we get that there are different ways to obtain the calculations which help us to corroborate the results. Also, that comparing the two cases, we observe that if the portfolio contains people of the same age, the premium value is lower. This can be translated into the portfolio being less risky for the insurer. Finally, it should be noted that the preference for, of one model over another depends on the programming team and the time available. But it is worth noting that we live in a democracy. And so when we take a vote within the team, we can say that the initial distribution approach is better because it is more accurate. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, do not forget to leave your like and also your comment. Click on the subscribe button and turn on the notification so you will know when we upload a new video. Bye!